<sighs> How are we doing? Feeling a bit inspired? Yeah. yeah. Whenever uh, myself and Mary talk about our plans for the God's Way of Love organisation, we often feel quite inspired uh, because we really are enjoying... I'm just going to move this forward. Is that all right? Yep, no worries. It's just that sun's right in the board and it makes me look darker than I am. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we we often, myself and Mary, feel really inspired about the different things that we can see the organisation doing in the future. And one thing I just explained um, to to Zenko actually is that quite often what we're doing is we're waiting for people to uh, feel their desires and passions before we do anything. So a lot of times we notice you waiting for us to tell you what to do. And I'm going, sorry, but that's never going to happen. <laughs> What's going to happen instead is for you to actually engage your desires and, and we notice those desires inside of you and then we'll just come along and make some suggestions, some suggestions to you about different things. Now, that's how, in fact, almost every team leader has been appointed at this point. Almost every team leader has been appointed by us noticing their desires and passions which are separate to um, God's way of love. Like it's got nothing to do with God's way of love. They've just engaged their desires and passions that we've noticed it and then said, oh, would you mind leading that particular team? And, uh, and that's how every team leader has actually been appointed so far by us noticing the person who we feel has the most passion and desire for that particular thing. Okay, so um, we finished our discussion so far about, we talked about the generalities of the two different types of things that we'll be doing in God's way of love, basically, which are, one is having benefit to individuals or organisations, and the other was having a benefit to the world. And remember, we said that we're going to focus our attention more specifically upon the areas that have a benefit to the world rather than a benefit to an individual. But that doesn't mean we're not interested in the individual. We still want to help individuals and we want to help individual organisations and so forth. But if it has a benefit to the whole world, then obviously that will take our higher priority. That's, that's the goal. What I would like to talk about now is the specific things that are going on so far in each location as to what the uh, potential is regarding creating learning centres in different locations. Now, remember our definition of a learning centre is not really a, so much a learning centre. It's a focus on a bringing um, benefit to the world and the learning team the learning center so a learning center to us is just a project so it's actually a project that brings benefit to the world that happens on somebody's property does that make sense to everyone Project that brings benefit to the world that happens on somebody's pro um, so it happens on somebody's pro property. So really, all of the things that bring benefit to the world are going to be, if we if we stop seeing them so much as learning centres and start seeing them as projects that we're engaging, of which one type of project is a learning centre. Right. And a learning centre, in a way, is going to be what well, we see. We see it as being a place where people can come and find out all sorts of projects that are all going on, all on different things, you know, different subjects and so forth. And some of those, are, we feel, the projects will engage every form of interest or in that a person on earth can have, including interest in the spirit world. By the way. So it'll be interesting, the engagement between the spirit world and humanity with a lot of these projects. 
Now, in the case of the learning centres, remember we stated that it has a particular focus for us because it allows us to put together a lot of projects at once and have a central location in order to deal with these particular projects. But remember the proviso was that any person who considers entering a learning centre needs to have this focus on the benefit to the world uppermost in their mind and heart. So much so that even if there's no benefit to themselves, they still want to do it. Now, I suggest to you there will always be a benefit to a person who does it, um, but, but even if there was none, they would still want to go ahead with it because of the passion that they feel. Now, at this stage, there's a, a number of different people, and I was wondering whether you guys, the current owners of the current project that we have, the current centre out at Wilstow, whether you wouldn't mind perhaps being involved in this discussion with me to answer people's questions if you want to be. Are you happy with that? Um, would it be best for us... You, most of you are sitting together anyway, aren't you? It's one, two, three, four. There's, where's Di? There she is. Would you mind sitting... I'm sorry, Di. Would you, would you mind sitting up near the guys so that we could have a mic up there permanently? And who else is missing? Rita. Rita's outside, so... Um, yep. Now, um, if we can use the other mic now to go yep, around to the, to the audience, because there might be questions, but there might be specific things that we want to discuss with you, like that, that the audience might want to ask yourselves. Um, I do not want to speak for the current owners of this particular property. What's the name, proper name of the property again, Brad? It's, is it Kushni or... It's Kushni. Yeah, so it's on. It's on the. Um, uh, it's on the Chinchilla um, Durong Road, isn't it? What's the road actually called? Chinchilla Rondai Road. And I, I live off on of the, the corner Kushni. of. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep going, Brad. If you can use the mic. And on the corner of Home Creek Loop Road. That's right. And the corner, Chinchilla Wanda Road. Corner, Home Creek Loot Road. Yeah. It's a, a property that's about a couple of kilometres from my, Mary and my own home. Uh, it's around about 600 acres. That's right. Not much. A little under, but yeah, about that. It's the property that many of you have come out and done things on already. Now, there are current owners to that particular property. Um, so who would we... Would this Rob and Ange? Griff, Griffiths? Griff, uh, Griffiths? Oh, that's an eye. Um, we've got Bradley... Uh, last name, Bradley again. <laughs> no, I mean, how to spell it. N-U-R-N-B-E-R-G. Yep. Graham, tell me if I'm wrong, Graham. This other land, I think. Is that correct? Uh, there's Diana. What's the last name spelled here? Marshall. Marshall, with a C or an S? M-A-R-S-H. S-H, sorry. <laughs> and Rita. And Rita's last name? Ben, uh, Hogel Bendix, isn't it? H-O-G-E-L. With an uh, With an omelette. <laughs> sorry, Rita, if it's wrong. Something like that. They are the current collective owners of that property. Now, um, I've had a discussion with a group of owners about this change. We had a discussion a few weeks ago uh, talking about this particular change. And the change being their original intention was that they were going to donate the property to the God's Way of Love organisation if the God's Way of Love organisation received tax exemption status, which I've explained in our previous in our previous discussion that that's not the case. 
And, and also, the God's Way of Love organisation doesn't have the means to pay for the stamp duty or anything like that required. And also, we feel quite strongly that the owners of the property, uh, that this new arrangement is a much better arrangement than the old arrangement anyway, where the owners of the property retain ownership. Now, what we've done is we've had a meeting together and the owners have decided who they want to be on the title of the property. Does that make sense? And they're going through this process together now in their own negotiations and talks with each other. They're going through the process of who wishes to be on the title for that particular property, this particular property. As my understanding currently goes, and please correct me, you guys, if, if I'm wrong, the, all of the current owners have a passion and desire to benefit the world with the property. Isn't that basically the case? So all of them have agreed that they would love to see the property be a learning centre. Does that make sense? Now, um, that being the case, um, I've suggested to them that they make an agreement towards, with each other towards that end. Because of, because of there being a number of different owners, they have the additional complexity of what if one of those owners disagrees? And what they've got to do is work out what they want to do with those kind of disagreements. And so I've made some recommendations, which I've noticed you sent me, Ange, a few days ago, so an example of an agreement between each other, and it looks fairly good to me. I, I haven't looking at, looked at it in major detail at this point. But what they were attempting to do is ensure that even if one of the current owners disagree, that the property remains a learning centre rather than gets something else done, done with it. And that's something they are sorting out between themselves. So what I've suggested for them to do is to sort that issue out and when all of them are in agreement, they choose who is on the title of the property, they, they determine who is the person that's going to deal with the God's Way of Love organisation, the representative, if you like, of the owners, and once they do that, we can enter into the project of a learning centre that benefits the world on that particular property. Does that make sense? Now, I expect that'll take just a, maybe a few more weeks at the most. And uh, I think each of you seem to be pretty, from my discussions with each of you, you seem to be pretty firm about what you, what you want. And I feel that's wonderful. Now, the key is, and one of the reasons why I haven't discussed it with all of you before this time is because I wanted the owners of the property to make sure that it's their own feelings that they're feeling and not yours about the property. Does that make sense? They own the property and so therefore they have the right to determine what happens to it. And so I wanted to not present anything about this to the rest of all of you until they were quite firm in their own mind and heart about what they wanted to do. Does everyone get that? But at this stage, uh, could I say some things generally? And again, if you wish to correct me, just let me know. Um, at this stage, the feeling amongst the group of owners is they do dearly want the property to be a property that benefits the world and therefore a learning centre project. Now, how, that f how the form of that takes on is a little bit dependent upon other matters which at the moment I cannot discuss with you, unfortunately. In other words, there are other things afoot that will affect how we use this property in the future. And those particular issues have, uh, are under the decision of a few different people and I need to wait for them to decide what they want to do before we actually decide how this property will be used. For that reason, we've decided at this stage to put any building on the property, on this property, on hold for a short period of time. Does that make sense? We were going to put a manager's quarters on the property and, and the owners were going to, uh, to, to do that, basically, um, or some of the owners were going to do that. But at this stage, we've decided just to put that on hold for a short period of time until we know some of the additional facts that we need to put together. Now, I don't even want to intimate what those additional things are at this stage because I would like the other people involved in those things to be free to make their own choices without your emotional projection. But could I say that there is the potential for a larger property to be involved in, in, the, in a learning centre project in our area, 
and we're just sort of waiting for the decisions of different people to work out what's going to happen with that with those particular additions is there any questions you would like to ask bear in mind that i cannot answer the questions associated with these other possible developments i'm just indicating to you there are other possible developments does that make sense <laughs> Because it's important to me that the people involved in those developments are left free to make their own choices and decisions without any projection from any of us to force them into any decisions. Is there any questions you'd like to ask the owners? or yeah, Fire away, Graham. I have a question that might just clarify for me and for others maybe about our relationship with God's way of love. Yep. Um, I've had a, noticed a, there's a number of people around the place that are somewhat itinerant but are looking for places to store stuff. You know, they might be wanting to store seeds or, or, or whatever, camping gear or something like that. And, and, um, and it had occurred to me that on the property there's a really good spot where Brad's shed was. Um, Brad's just told me the shed's been removed now. Yep. And that, that it might be a good spot to, to put... an containers where people that as individuals wish to store stuff that yeah. might be useful after earth changes or before or something so that people can be a little bit more flexible in the way they move around so how would we go about like if that's an idea from an owner yep um now obviously i have to run it by god's way of love yep so how would that process work i'm making a suggestion yep so where does it go from here? Right. Um, I would start looking at, okay, what do we want to do with that area of the property is the first thing. The second thing is, are we in the, are we in the business of storing people's stuff or are we in the business of turning the property into a, a learning centre in its full condition? Now, I would suggest to you that we're not in the business of storing people's stuff. And I feel actually that people need to be personally responsible for their own stuff, actually, because that is a part of taking responsibility for your own life. Secondly, so there's an issue of love there about themselves. Secondly, there's an issue of love with the property itself. So the property itself has had an area cleared, and what I would like to do is put that area back into its pristine condition rather than have it remain cleared, rather than putting... Um, you know, man-made, probably shipping containers, in a location which is not really suitable. The third thing, if you look at the property, the property looks something like this to look at at the moment, if it's saying that's the main road, and this is the here along, sorry, if we just put it like that, here's the, here's the Home Creek loot road going along there. The most damaged part of the property is between there and there, at the bottom. This is the damaged area of the property. Remember I said some time ago that the best way to use any property is to firstly put anything to do with humans on the most damaged area of the property. The least damaged area of the property is this uh, area here, in that area, with the exception of the orchard at the top, and there's an orchard here which is pretty damaged. Right? So those two areas are damaged. Brad's shed is smack bang in the middle <laughs> of the least damaged area. Now, if we chose to put shipping containers in that area, can you see we're adding to its damage? So from God's way of love perspective, that would not be a very good decision and we would actually advise against it. Does that make sense? Yep. For those reasons. Um, now, if people decided they wanted to store things down here, then we've got to start considering, all right, are we in the business of storing things for people or are we actually wanting to use the property to teach about love and one thing I would suggest to, that we need to teach about love is that everybody be personally responsible for their own possessions and if, that, if that's the case then they need to consider storing them on their own property or, 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 or paying for storage or something like that now, there may be the case for specific particular things to be stored there depending on their long-term benefit to the property, not to the person. So in other words, 
we wouldn't make the decision based on whether it benefits the individual who wants to store the material, but rather we would make the decision based on whether it benefits the property, the learning centre property. Does that make sense? And I would suggest in most cases that it wouldn't benefit the learning centre property and it would just create an eyesore and a bit of rubbish to, on the property and more development on the property than is necessary. So my, my general feeling is generally I would resist doing things like that, you know, storing stuff on property for other people. Now, now on my personal property, I do have other people's stuff getting stored, but it's, also, but it's in the most damaged area and they and I have talked about it, you know, in terms of agreement. But if, if my property was a learning centre, I wouldn't have allowed it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the same principle applies. Yeah. Does that answer your question for that particular thing? Yes, it does. And it also answers it in the general sense in terms of... Of, of the process. An, ...an owner's relationship with God's way of love. Yeah. So we would explain to the owners why we feel such a thing is possible or not possible um, and it is the owner's choice as to whether that particular thing does happen or not happen but of course on a learning center if the owner disagrees then immediately there's a severance of the relationship of, a, of it being a learning center and that's that's the hard point for the owners considering a learning center is that is it only takes one issue to to break the agreement and that that's that's pretty difficult to handle, I feel, for a lot of people. And that's why many people need to consider strongly whether they really want to enter such an agreement. Yep. Um, yeah. Any questions about that? No, uh, that's good. Yeah. Jen? Mine's a funny question. Um, from God's perspective, is it a good thing to be an owner of property? You know, like... There's a parable in the Bible that said um, about the three brothers and, and how, um, well, you know which one I mean <laughs> without me trying to paraphrase. Well, there's also another parable. You coined that talks about, it, so I, was, I know you know. Well, there's another one I talked about where I told a person to sell all of his possessions and give them all away. Yep, go So on. I guess from my perspective, I have never really wanted to own... In, and never have sought to. I've always rented, and so it's not really about me. It's about the question of, from God's perspective, um, is it a good thing to be an uh, an owner of property, and then to use it wisely in the service of others? Um, how how does that sit with all of this? Yeah, I understand the question. Um, like I said, all owners are really caretakers. So that's all we are. Because we only ever have a property for a short period of time, don't we? How, how many of you have owned a property for 80 years? <laughs> Nobody. Have any of you owned a property for 60 years? 50 years? My family has owned it for 100 years. 100 years, yeah. So, but that's a family. How about yourself individually? How old are you now? Family. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to even answer? <laughs> Don't want to answer that question. <laughs> so, 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 can you see that even owning something for a hundred years is pretty amazing, isn't it? Do we really own it? We're just really a caretaker of it for a hundred years. That's all. And and so, in the end, we are really Jen just caretakers. Right? So, let's write that down. Now, if we were just a caretaker. Our focus would be, how are we caring? How are we going to care for this particular land? Now, what we're doing with God's way of love is we're saying that everything we do needs to be brought into harmony with God's love and truth. That's really what we're saying. Now, I suggest to you that a caretaker who's really sincere about caretaking for land would probably have exactly the same goal and ideal in that they want to take care of it the way God would intend for them to take care of it. Now, unfortunately on the planet, that's pretty rare. Most of us have very selfish motivations for owning property and very selfish motivations on our property. 
write down the comfort. We sacrifice animals, birds and other living creatures for the sake of our comfort. And we, we just have so many unloving emotions towards the property that we're not really caretakers. You could call us, uh, what would you call us? Maybe destroyers <laughs> would be the best word. I'm a destroyer of my property. Like, I'm not the owner of my property, I'm the destroyer of my property. And it's not even mine, let's face it. So um, my suggestion is, firstly, we need to change our own mentality. However, I would love to be a caretaker of lots of properties because I know my own intentions. And my own intentions for every property is good. Like, they're, they're based on world intentions, benefiting the world and all those things. So I wouldn't mind being the caretaker of hundreds or even thousands of properties if I had the resources at my disposal to do such a thing. Does that make sense? And I wouldn't feel afraid of such responsibility because I know what my intentions are. Do, do, does that make sense? So it really gets down to the intentions of the caretaker. Or, if we change the name, the intentions of the owner. If you own for an intention to prove your worth, to have control, to address your fears and to satisfy the addictions in your fears and so forth, then I suggest to you that you're not owning for the right reasons. If you own for the purpose of bringing the property of which you're a caretaker now into harmony with God's love and truth, now we have some really good intentions. And it really gets down to the intention, doesn't it? And it doesn't matter what name you put on it. What matters is the intention of the individual. Yeah, what, what's coming from their heart. And a lot of people can say they're passionate about bringing benefits to the world, but the reality is many times their own actions prove that that's not the case. Right? So just because we state an intention, it doesn't actually mean that we have one that's loving. And this is what we need to consider in all of these arrangements. Now, it's going to be difficult for, care, for caretakers or the owners of a potential learning centre project in the sense that they're almost giving up all sense of ownership, although they have all the responsibilities associated with an owner. And that's pretty confronting, you see. Whoever is on the title of that property you know, under current law has the full responsibility for that property, full responsibility legally for what happens on the property. There's a lot of responsibility in all of that. And the owners are basically taking that responsibility while at the same time gifting the property to the world, which is a pretty loving, I feel, and an amazing thing that they consider. I don't know about you, but I feel that's a pretty amazing thing to consider. And for this reason, I have a lot of respect for each of these owners because of their intention and because of what I can feel is in their heart about the world. And I feel a lot of respect for them, and that is the reason why I have private conversations with them before I have a public conversation with you. Because it's so important to me that the decision is coming from their heart um, with regard to the property. But as you can see, Graham would have liked to put some shipping containers up there maybe for people to store stuff. And my response to that was, yeah, I don't feel that's a loving process. And then, unfortunately, because it's a learning centre, or potentially one, it hasn't entered this agreement yet, but it's potentially a learning centre, if Graham said, but I want to go ahead with that, I would say, well, we don't have a learning centre. A lot of you will feel that's quite harsh, wouldn't you? But, but that's not what I feel. Yeah. I feel that all I'm trying to do is put into practice the principles that I'm teaching you about love right across the board. That's all. It's okay what the owners choose to do, but we can't be involved with that anymore. That's my feeling. Yep. Now, um, with regard to that particular allotment of land, if we can call it that, because it's not yet really a learning centre, under the definition that I've given to you today. With regard to this particular lot of land, the owners do want it to be a learning centre. And as I've said to you, there are some additional factors that may come into play as to how we use the land and for that reason um, we, we've decided to for a short period of time suspend development of any buildings on the land 
until we know what uh, other options we have available. And we're hoping to resolve that within a few months or so. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Okay. So any other questions about that particular land? No? That's pretty easy. Nina, right up the back there. If, where's, the, where's that other travelling mic? Yep, thanks. It's all right. I guess I'm... Oh, yeah, the delay. Just the example that you gave with Graham, that one person out of the majority doesn't agree with it being a learning centre, that the whole thing gets scrapped. I'm struggling with that somehow. No, no. What I said was this. What they're doing between themselves as owners is making an agreement that looks after the fact that if one person doesn't want it to be a learning centre, that that particular issue is addressed without it stopping being a learning centre. Okay. So they are making a personal agreement between themselves. It has nothing to do with God's way of love. It's a personal agreement that they are constructing between each other which determines what will happen if one of them disagree. Does that make sense? Because there's more than one owner. Yeah. You see, if it was only one owner, the owner either agrees or disagrees. But if there's five owners or six owners, then one of them might disagree and the other five might all agree. What do you do under those circumstances? They as owners need to decide that. that has no, that's none of my business. Does it make sense? That makes more sense to me, yes. Now, what they're doing between themselves, because they all have a desire for the property to be of benefit to the world, they're making an agreement between each other that one owner can't disagree and then change the course of the whole thing. Does that make sense? That answers my question, yeah. yes. But that is up to them as owners. It has nothing to do with me. And all I've been involved with was that I advised them to make that agreement. Does that make sense? Because if they don't make that agreement, one owner can change the course of everybody's life, yeah. particularly if some of them are you know, putting money in and building things there that they hope to live in and so forth, then it's going to be very difficult if one of them can just change the course of all of that. Yeah. Yep. No, that answers my question. Thank you. But it is an interesting question in that if you are a collective owner of a property, then there would need to be an agreement between the owners before the owners enter it into an agreement with God's way of love. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Obviously, the owners need to all be on the same page, at least at the outset. And they also need to have some kind of process in which to resolve any internal conflicts they have as owners that don't, so, that, so that it doesn't affect the property and what happens on the property. I feel that um, the dynamic that you're describing there has um, really useful implications for ho a whole host of different situations. Of course. Um, is it okay to share some of the suggestions you've given to the group? What I've suggested to the group of owners is that once they have an agreement in place, that they make that agreement public. And what I feel that will do is it will help... Um, anybody who wants to assist doing things on the property, it will help anybody to have some confidence in the process. Does that make sense? Now, once that agreement is public, you will have an idea of the type of agreement they've made and how, how it addresses and deals with conflict within the group of owners. I don't know if they're going to make it public. That was just my suggestion, by the way. <laughs> so don't, don't assume that they're going to make it public. Just, uh, it's a, just a suggestion that I've given. Yeah. Nina? There's another question there. <laughs> you can ask it. <laughs> I, I don't know it was so much a question, but I just see it as a... Real, a potentially a wonderful example of how to work as a group and resolve differences. So I'm really excited as to what comes out of that because I've yeah. seen that a lot of projects with really high ideals fail on that one point. Yes. And I think that to be able to negotiate that through that in an example and loving way is going to be a, just a really exciting thing to, 
to see. Yes, I feel so too. I feel that if we have the focus of benefit to the world, even if a person disagrees with myself personally, there should still be some connection with the ideal of having a benefit to the world. Does that make sense? And while my and your definition of what's benefit to the world may be different, um, there's, even, even if I had to withdraw my support for a particular property being a learning centre, I do not see why a group of persons who desire it to be a learning centre would not still proceed with their desires. Can you see? Now, in the case of uh, many you know, projects that have happened on the planet that have had, like you said, good intentions at the start, unfortunately, the good intentions did not include changing their emotions in order to become more loving. <laughs> right? And this is, what, uh, this is what obviously we're teaching. The God's Way of Love organisation is all about understanding and becoming more loving and helping people become more loving in practical situations. And so we feel quite strongly that if everyone who is a caretaker or an owner of a property has this deep desire within them to become more loving no matter what, then there's no reason why our ideals would change and become divergent. I can't see why they would not remain directly in harmony with, with, them, with each other because we all have that same passionate desire. Does that? Yeah. yeah. And this is what I noticed with the group of owners is that they, are, they may have different opinions on different subjects, but on the subject of what they would like to have happen to the land and what kind of things they'd like to see practice on it, they have a desire for it to benefit the world and be a learning centre for divine truth and divine love. That's their passion and desire. Now, I don't see any impediment to that occurring aside from the emotions of the owners. And all of them know that. That's the beauty. They all know that. That's why they're passionate. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Whereas uh, for many other pl things that have happened on the earth uh, in terms of these kind of projects, the, the emotional condition of each person involved is often quite different and has a huge impact upon how everything works together in the long run. But this is also another reason why we, would, we want, with regard to the learning centres, the God's Way of Love organisation to, if you like, provide the direction. It directs the project. And the reason, reason why is we need one director of a project, even if that director is wrong. <laughs> Does everyone get that? Like, because if you have more than one, that's when you start getting all sorts of you know, cross-purposes happening and all sorts of things happen. To, if I can give an example, um, on the particular land in question, there were different people doing different projects that were all divergent from each other for different reasons. This was up till now. And if you add up all the money that was spent doing those divergent projects, we would have some pretty good impressive projects already on the land, right? that weren't divergent with that amount of money that was spent. And that's the problem with having diverging interests, is when you have diverging interests, often all these different things happen, none of which are coordinated, and usually there's a lack of economy in the entire process as well. Yep. For me, what I find so exciting, like I'm so excited about this conversation, is just that love is what's guiding the whole thing and you've spent a great deal of time with us helping us understand what love would do from God's perspective. Yep. And I'm, I'm just hugely excited by yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, and this is, this is the thing uh, I, myself and Mary both feel very passionate about is that we want love to be the guiding principle of every choice and decision that is made on a learning centre. That's the guiding principle, nothing else. So we're not interested in self-interest. We're not interested in the self-interest of others. We're not interested in making things easy for others just because it's convenient. We want to have love as the primary choice every single time. And, uh, and while we're all imperfect, that's not always going to be possible. But, but if we have that as the goal, then there's a high likelihood we'll reach it. 
But if we have a lower goal, you know, of toler tolerance of all sorts of unloving behaviour and so forth, then of course we're never going to reach that perfect ideal. Yeah. Jen? So we're in the first generation of this. Mm -hmm. What happens in the case with the God's way of love if you or Mary or both of you become deceased? And what happens to the learning centres and the ongoing projects if um, owners become deceased? Um, if the owners of a property, let's answer the second question first. If the owners of a property die, that property would normally become a part of their estate. And unless there's a will, um, that will come, the, the estate will be distributed based on the will. Or if there's no will, it'd be distributed through generally through their relatives. That's generally the case. So our suggestion is that any property that is a learning centre, the, the issue of a will needs to be addressed so that the owners that are left over get the portion of ownership that the owners who have died have relinquished. Does that make sense? So that's a, an agreement that the owners, again, would need to make between each other. But it's only our suggestion, that's all. The issue of what happens if Mary and I die... Well, at the moment, the way I've written the, the God's Way of Love Constitution is that if Mary and I die, nobody else can change the Constitution. But the general membership determines the direction of the organisation and appoints directors. Now, at the moment, we only have four members of the organisation. And we are going to, over the next month or so, invite... Up to, uh, around about 30, we feel, is all we need as members of the organisation. And we're going to pick the people who are members of the organisation and ask them whether they want to become members <laughs> or not. If they want to become a member, they'll become members of the organisation. If Mary and I die, those people will guide the organisation. But they cannot change the constitution. So if Mary and I pass... Nobody can change the Constitution. The Constitution remains as it currently is. The only people who can change the Constitution according to the Constitution is Mary and myself or anyone who becomes an associate member. And the definition in the Constitution of an associate member is a person who is at one with God who wants to be a member of the organisation. So in other words... Aside from Mary and myself changing the Constitution, the only other people possible to change the Constitution is a person who's at one with God. And I would suggest that they're the best person to change the Constitution. Does that make sense? Now, so the, the organisation itself, it, once we get the additional members all sorted through, at the moment there's four members. There's myself and Mary and Rob and Ange. And the only reason why we've set it up that way is we needed somebody to be written on the paper to be sent to the... Uh, you know, to the ASIC, to the Australian Securities Investments Commission. Um, but what we want to do is invite a general membership of around 30 and those members will determine what happens to the organisation and they will also appoint directors of the organisation. Now, at the moment, myself, Mary, Rob and Andrew are also the directors of the organisation for the moment. And, uh, and that will remain until such a time as the members get together and we start appointing other people. Yep. So the way we've designed the organisation is that you cannot change the constitution unless you're on a sufficient, have a sufficient amount of love to change the constitution or your Mary or myself. <laughs> Basically that's the only people that can change the constitution. And we've left it as Mary and myself even though we're not yet in that condition because somebody had to be able to change the constitution at this point. If we have a mic down here. If we can bring that one down, yeah, that'd be good. Thanks, Peter. Could any changes to the Constitution be channeled? Yes. Is that a possibility? Of course. Um, that's how we created most of the Constitution. <laughs> So, you know, most of the constitution that we've already written was, was written in a way that we, basically 
I sat there channeling my own soul about <laughs> what I wanted in the Constitution and we had a lot of spirit uh, assistance with different modifications uh, of what I've of, I had written. Yep. Yep. Certainly. We want to involve our spirit friends in the, you know, in the process. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Graham? Um, in the advent of in the future, uh, you and Mary might be deceased. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like with the Christian religion, a couple of hundred years down the track, yep. um, somebody puts their hand up and says, I'm at one with God um, and I want to change the constitution. Yeah. Um, how do we know that he's at one with God? Well, um, you've already seen where Mary and I are with regard to love and we're not yet at one with God. So I would suggest for you just to compare them with what you remember uh, <laughs> we, we, we are like and you've got now video record of what we're like and everything else and uh, if you find that they're insufficient to that then you know definitely they're not at one with God yet when when a person on earth becomes at one with God you will definitely know and um, when I say you'll definitely know you'll be able to recognize it they will also have the ability to heal and to do a lot of other things um, they won't be wearing glasses and they won't be <laughs> having all those kind of things so you, you will soon see, you, you'll see them grow young in front of your eyes pretty much uh, where they'll be you know, 50, 60 years old and they'll look 25 around about. Um, so you know, there'll be plenty of proof, Graham, that a person's at one with God. Like in the first century, lots of people didn't think you were. Um, I agree. Um, they didn't think I was, but anybody who associated with me at the time knew that there was something very, very different in me. Uh, and a 2,000-year and a Christian movement doesn't begin with a person who's in a terrible condition. Mm. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Alex, right out the back. Sorry, Pete. Pete's got his joggers on at the moment. <laughs> back and forward. Good on you, mate. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, I love your shirt by the way Thank you mate it Reminds me of Rhinestone Cowboy I got it in Texas <laughs> <There you go. laughs> um, This is a question that's been sort of bandied around a few times And there's a bit of uncertainty about it mm -hmm. And some people have had the desire to um, throw together money And buy the property next door yeah. To the current um, learning centre so maybe, I don't know if this is even the right forum for it, but I'm just curious. I don't curious. feel so, no. Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, there's, uh, yeah, I feel that any discussion about the matter would prejudice what's happening at this point in time. I'm happy to discuss it after it's occurred, um, but not beforehand. Cool. Is that, is that all right? Yes, yeah, yeah, I just feel that the different laws of attraction need to work and the way they're working and the different people involved need to do what they do. And we'll just see how it all works out. If anybody is interested in such a thing, I, I certainly am happy to talk with them individually because there are people interested in doing such a thing. But as I've spoken to the people who are interested in doing it, they need to be really sure of their own passion and desire. All right? I, I don't want to say too much more because this is a public forum and uh, this will be placed on the internet. And as a result, I don't want to prejudice any you know, any personal discussions or private arrangements that anybody has at this point in time. Sure, fair yep. enough. Yep. Can, can I just say that um, I grew up for a very short time in my life in a communist regime yep. w which collapsed. Yep. And now we're on the verge of seeing capitalism collapse. Yep. And people always have said there's no such thing as a perfect system. Yep. You know, I've heard that so often. Yep. But I get such an awesome feeling about this and I, and I feel like this... I don't know. I feel like it's just so much hope for yep. this. Let me that just it write. Can be taken on. God's system is perfect. <laughs> yeah. When we discover God's system, we'll we'll see that. So what we need to do as a human race is discover God's system, and then we'll have discovered a perfect system of government. And uh, I feel the, the potential of that happening on the earth in the hearts of people initially is where it has to begin, um, is already underway. 
like I feel that's already underway. You look at the majority of people on earth, that they are quite tired of the different forms of systems that are on the earth. And they're also, many of them are quite tired with their own life looking after uh, the system that they currently are in. So, um, yeah, you know, th there will be changes uh, that occur um, coming up and perhaps even more rapidly you know, may occur at the same time as earth changes or perhaps even before. The economy at the moment is not looking very bright and uh, as a result some collapse might occur before we see uh, earth changes actually occur. But God's system is perfect and all we need to do is discover God's system and then put it into practice. And that's what I called in the first century, like I said in the first century that I was establishing God's kingdom in heaven and, uh, and our hope is to establish God's kingdom on earth. Um, now, but it, but it has to happen with the cooperation of every individual. <laughs> That's the issue. Yep. But there is definitely forms of government that we can engage, and this is one of the roles of God's way of love, I hope in the future, is to advise governments how to change, to become more loving and in more harmony with God's system. And eventually we'll get some brave enough country to actually employ, Im, implement God's system completely. Yeah. Imagine that. You have one country implementing God's system completely. Australia. <laughs> it doesn't worry me which country it is. The, it's interesting though, the emotions involved in Australia. <laughs> that's, 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 uh, there are some emotions there. Oh, you, know, like, you see, a, a lot of times we even have ownership to the country that we came from. We, you know, we have this inner nationalistic pride. And my suggestion is if you have it within you, to try to re eradicate it from you. Because in the end, we are all world citizens and we live on an earth that is so integral to our um, survival that unless we understand we are all world citizens, we are going to create a lot of these issues of inter-country rivalry or nationalism. Yeah, and I understand that many of us have grown up with that from the time we were babies, you know, this nationalistic pride. And it, and it is a very damaging emotion to, to development of love on the planet. Mm. Yep. Okay, any other questions about the Kushni property that you might like to ask? Or ask the owners uh, if you wish to ask them directly? No? Jen, you got another one? That's all right. It's okay, you don't need to be embarrassed. <laughs> this is a really hard question for me to ask. Um, in the beginning, in the birth of the property, I had lots of feelings that I felt were from the celestials about the guidance of the property. And a lot of that has changed for me and I've lost heart. Mm -hmm. What happens for a person who comes onto the property and it's a learning centre, any learning centre, and they, I, get feelings and you don't know whether, I didn't know at the time whether that was pure, st I still really don't. You get a feeling about stuff that's bigger and beyond you know what you know and you go to cry and communicate that and you have how many owners five owners yep well back then four was it when you were doing that yeah four yep um and at that time i didn't have anything else except the powers of anger which weren't <laughs> pa which weren't powerful at all it's no diminishes your capability to be able to communicate yeah and your, in, in and your a, credibility yes mm. in a rational way yep there's two parts to this question what do you do in that circumstance when you have i guess this was underlying the previous question i asked about the difference between just a normal citizen which i feel i am and an owner yep. is there a difference in god's perspective and if you are a person who comes onto the property who 
get to these prevailing feelings about like where do you understand already what my question is? Yep. Where does it can lie? I can I go ahead and answer it? Please. That'd be good. <laughs> there is a large difference between a normal citizen and an owner. And you know what the big difference is? The law of attraction. Well no, the owner has had enough passion to put their life on the line to purchase the property. Whereas the normal citizen hasn't. And there's a big difference between those two things. The, these owners have had, they've got their own funds, some of, which are, some of which are quite limited now, but they've put their own money into the property because of their passion. So that, there, is a, there is a larger sense of, of love for the property in them than there is in many of the average persons who will come to the property. Can you see the difference? But I had love when I started there. No, I was suggesting you didn't. No. You would never have gotten angry if you had love when you started there. You see? See, what happened was you started noticing things happening on the property, some of which you felt condemnation towards. Agreed? Yes. But you didn't recognise the one truth, and that is the, they were the owners of the property and they had the right to do whatever they wanted based on law. They had the right to do whatever they wanted to the property. But isn't there a greater cause here when you call it a learning centre or at that stage it was called a sanctuary? Um, isn't there a, a Of course there's a greater cause, but if the emotions good. of the owners are that they don't want to follow that greater cause, and at the time some of the owners certainly did not want to follow the greater cause, they had a self-interest involved, and, and I suggest to you now the group of owners don't have that self-interest involved. But... but because they didn't have a greater cause emotion going on within themselves, they felt they had the right to do what they wanted to the property. And the reality is, as far as they were concerned by law, they had more of a right to do it than you did. Agreed? Because you didn't own it. And when you then get angry with an owner, when you have no investment in the property whatsoever, aside from an emotion then you are demonstrating a fact that you do not understand one basic principle and that is they had enough desire to purchase it whereas you did not. Right? And that in itself gives them certainly more right to decide what to do than you do. Now, I'm not saying that if they were in harmony, if they were in harmony with love, with God's love in particular, that they would not have chosen to do certain things. I do believe that if they were in harmony with love, they would have chosen to do very different things. I had a discussion with those group of owners before they bought the property about what I recommended they did, and they did not do those things. And that's okay. That's their choice because they owned it. I, had no, I have no right to do anything other than make a recommendation. Do you understand? That's why I'm not angry with them. <laughs> but you are. And there's an issue there. You see? The issue is a lack of love in yourself. You're the one who's angry with them. So there's an issue of a lack of love within yourself. See, I can feel it. I'm really glad I had the courage to ask you the question. It's a very I, good question. Because I, I can feel the anger. I can feel it yep. coming up. I'm going to go. That's okay. That's okay. Um, there was a second part of the question, though. Thank can you, you remind me of it? Yes, there was a second part in that there was a certain vision for the property at that particular time, be it pure or impure? Well, ah, yes, the answer to that is the vision was my own, not theirs. If it was theirs, what would have been our collective vision would now have already occurred. But it was only my own, right? And I wasn't the owner of the property, so I can't determine what they do with their vision. Now, I've, I've spoken to some of them about their vision and the discrepancies between the two. Does that make sense? But it is their business what they do with their property. And I respect that. Yep. So no matter what damage was done, and some time, we, we will spend some money to actually clean up some of the damage in the future, and I don't see that as a major disaster. I just see that as a learning experience. Some people made some mistakes. We learn from the mistakes 
we learn also how to clean up after mistakes. That's a very, very good thing to learn because many of us are going to have lots to clean up afterwards and we need to learn how to do it. I guess I can feel what's welling up inside of me is that challenge of authority yes. and the fact that I had a lack of respect for... For their authority. Indi ...individual free will. Exactly. And... Um, and that is a big emotional and a, and reason. A, and a chronic fear of... Um, but because you've got a lack of respect for their free will, you then project anger at them, right, for not doing what you think they should have done. Now, not even God projects anger at them. So what we're setting... By projecting anger at a person for not doing what we think they should have done, what we're doing is setting ourselves up above God. Does that make sense? So we're being quite arrogant. We're even doing what God would not do. <laughs> yep. And this is something we need to come to terms with. The fact that people will make mistakes. Sometimes they'll even do it on purpose. But they have the will. They have free will and God gave them that gift to do that. All I'm saying is, when it comes to God's way of love's interaction with the owners, the agreement will terminate the immediate, as soon as the owners decide not to do God's way do things God's way. Thank you for being so direct with me because I can feel underneath now, you know, I can feel the anger that's still there and I can feel the sadness underneath Yeah. and yeah. the issues. So thank you very yeah. much for your direction. Yeah. Anytime we have an issue with authority, Jen, usually the issue in the end has something to do with one or both parents. Big issues with one or both parents. And a lot of that is grief about how the parents have acted or used their authority. And many times I've used it in a very unloving manner. And as a result, we have a lot of grief to feel because of that. Yeah. Is that me clicking? Okay, does, that, does everyone understand what I was saying to Jen there? Like, yeah. Up the back. Where's the, oh, there, there he comes. If you hold it up for Pete so you can see. Thanks, Peter, for running around for us, mate. Um, I just have a question. It's kind of a little bit off to topic, but it was... Um, sorry, I'm really, really nervous. So I hate asking questions. Yeah. Far away. <laughs> um, it was just about how you said that... Um, that you'd know if someone's at one with God, like, they'll become physically really beautiful. Um, but I've seen really attractive people that are really qu quite mean and Certainly. don't seem full of love. And then I see quite unattractive people and they're really kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. So I don't understand how that happens. Physical beauty isn't the only sign of somebody at one with God. So we, we need to look at everything. Remember I said that I'd have a relationship with God, that you'd feel their love coming from them. You would, feel, you would also feel, you know, you'd see their physical appearance and see that it's without blemish. You would also see, though, that they are acting in a manner that's without blemish in terms of love, right? They care about people. They're compassionate, understanding, kind. They're, they're just equal in all of their dealings. They don't get angry. They don't get upset. But they're emotional. They have emotional connection. All of those different things all add up. So don't just look at one thing and go, oh, that means that they're one with love. It's not like that. There's, there's lots of different things. And all you're doing is bringing up one of them and focusing on that rather than looking at the whole picture. So um, with physical beauty, is it kind of like the pick of the draw, whether you get good genes or...? Well, no. Well, how many 90-year-olds have you found really beautiful physically? Not many. Okay. <laughs> and what about 150-year-olds? Have you found many of them very beautiful? I haven't found any of them at oh, all. Okay. So, so, so what I'm suggesting to you, even if it takes 150 years of waiting, right, the person who's at one with God at 150 years old will still be 25. They'll still look 25. They'll still probably act lower than 25, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and, and they will also be loving and they'll be able to heal, they'll be able to do all these other things too. So, so if oh. it takes that long for you to work it out, that's all right. The Constitution just doesn't change for 150 years. And the Constitution's <laughs> already pretty good. Uh. Right, so <laughs> so um, 
Say if there's like a supermodel and then there's me, it doesn't necessarily matter, mean that um, they have like a better soul condition. Definitely or... not. Okay. It's what matters funny. is when the supermodel's 150 and you're 150, we'll see the difference then. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, AJ. Um, sorry, where was that? Coming from? There was someone who said AJ. Who said AJ? Oh, oh, thanks. Sorry. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, so that's what's happening with that particular property. Um, there's nothing more I can basically tell you because once the owners have worked out their agreement, then we can proceed. Yep. Um, my feelings are quite strong at the moment because I can feel the desires of all of the owners are quite strong that it's probably definitely going to become a learning centre agreement and uh, there's just a few things that need to be worked out between the owners should there be any disagreement. And, uh, and I feel that's going to be worked out quite rapidly already. They're working on that and have been working on that for the last few weeks. Okay. Any questions? Any other questions about that? No? Okay. Let's move on then. The other area um, that you probably have started to hear about um, is down near Armadale. Um, this, these don't rub off very easily, do they? Just change these. Yeah, so the other property um, we were offered a property to become a learning centre down near Armadale. Um, it's in the area called Kentucky, which is about fifty. 50 k's from Armadale, about the same distance from Tamworth in New South Wales. It's the high country, so it's around at about it's a thousand metres above sea level, um, and sometimes quite cold. <laughs> we were there last week and uh, it hailed, fairly large hail, just in the middle of the day for, for seemingly no reason. <laughs> you know, it was quite strange, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's quite a nice, it's a nice location. Now. The way that it is down there, um, I can't give you um, too much detail at this point because the, the, the issue is that we're still talking with the owners about their desires and intentions. Now, the Lytton Hitchens family own a property next door to the property that we've, been own, uh, that we've been offered. The property we've been offered is on a property called Dalveen and it's a thousand, around about a thousand acres of a uh, mixture of, uh, of sheep farm and um, bush. And then very next door to that, the Lytton Hitchens family own a property that uh, is around, at the moment, around, I think, about 15,000 acres. And that, that's the property that we're going to be planting trees on when we go down there in October for Oktoberfest. Now at this stage, the Lytton Hitchens family have not decided to make their particular property a learning centre and I feel no pressure upon them to do so. <laughs> Does that make sense? The other property, which, uh, was, which was a part of their property at one point, was bought by another couple, Ces Cecily and Paul, and they have decided they wanted to offer a part of that property to be the learning centre. At this point in time, we feel that that particular property will become more of a nature-based learning centre. In other words, will not have dwellings put on it, but rather be used to restore the farmland. And try, we want to try to make it an example of how to restore farmland back to pristine condition. Um, at the moment, it's been sheep farm country, and we'd like to restore it back to its pristine condition. The Lytton Hitchens family, though, have a deep, uh, passionate desire 
to bring their property in harmony with divine love. So at the moment, myself and them have entered what you would classify an owner's agreement, the first agreement that I mentioned to you. They are the owners of the property and, uh, and they just, they just uh, talk to me regarding what I recommend to happen on the property and in almost every case they pretty much have followed what we've suggested at this point in time. When you go down there, who's thinking of going down there? Is any, who, how many of you are thinking? Wow, should be fun. All right, that's good. Um, yeah, when we go down there, um, you'll find that they've actually swaled large amounts of their land um, with a bulldozer, actually. Uh, it's been very, very interesting because there was a three-inch rain when we were there and all the swales just collected all this water which didn't go like it's all now in the land and rather than just running away and eroding their creek that's at the bottom of their land. And where we're going to be planting our trees, the 10,000 trees we're hoping to plant, is all in this swaled area. It's a preparation of an area. They've got a government grant to do it. It's a preparation of an area going from uh, a nature strip and cr trying to create a joining of two nature strips together. And, uh, and we've got a large variety of different types of trees and plants to actually uh, to plant, to, to improve the land. We've now got it catching the water it needs to, to su sustain those plants without any, any irrigation. And we were even now able to consider growing some very, very large trees, some big forest trees, uh, because of the amount of water that we're able to collect now because of the swaling. So it's really looking quite good. When we were down there, every time we go down there, actually, uh, we get quite enthusiastic because the guys down there, the, the, fam the Lytton Hinderson's family, is very keen on doing the things to make things change. And, and almost every suggestion we make, they're very rapidly implementing it. And as a result, we do feel that this property and the adjoining property will uh, you know, be a sort of like a hive of activity or a centre of activity in New South Wales in the future. And the, the guys are very keen for that to occur. So while they may not yet or may not enter a learning centre agreement with us, they certainly, we certainly have in place what, what you'd call the first agreement, the owner's agreement, and it's working really, really well. And so that's one of the reasons why we've decided to do this planning thing, because they managed to get a grant that uh, enables us to buy all the trees, and they've bought all the trees, and the family has bought all the hay and all of the other things needed for planting. It just basically needs us with our tools to go there and there and do the job. So it should be, should be a lot of fun. One of the things they have also decided to do, which has been very interesting too, is, and it's something that I w want to talk about at all learning centres, what we're hoping to do is to get every learning centre almost fully self-sufficient in every way. This means fully self-sufficient sound systems, fully self-sufficient computer systems, fully self-sufficient uh, you know, uh, video production systems, and so forth. And the Lytton Hitchens family have spent quite a lot of their money doing that uh, already, setting up a fully self-sufficient system down there. And what we're hoping to do is to do that in every learning centre. So every learning centre has its capacity to produce its own videos, has the capacity to have its own little intranet, or like an internet but, but a private one, and has its own capacity to pr produce sound recordings and, and, and have teams running and everything. And at the moment they've spent quite a lot of their personal funds making that happen. And what I would love to do is the same for every other learning centre. So what some of our teams are doing at the moment, uh, the production team, and, uh, so, and mostly it's myself and Igor at this stage <laughs> doing a lot of the work, um, is that we're, we're ordering all this sound equipment and all this video equipment and everything together, and we put it together and package it in such a way that we can replicate it over and over again. And that way every learning centre can have a very similar equipment. We can train each learning centre to have people down there learning how to use all of that equipment and so forth. And, uh, and we feel that's a very positive thing because if earth changes occur in the manner that I feel they will at this point, there may be periods of time where we can't communicate with each other 
or we can only communicate with each other via high frequency radio transmissions. And, and if that's the case, it would be great if they could have their own seminars and their own delivery of divine truth in that location and their own you know, dis way of distributing some of that truth out to other people in that area and so forth. And so I feel quite passionate about that project myself in terms of replicating these systems over and over again. And we want to replicate the systems. Uh, we want to ha have teams as well doing this. Yep. Uh, so we want to replicate the teams over and over again as well. And that's already begun down there. They've already got their mediumship team uh, working um, and because it's one of their passions. And they've already got uh, an environment team working down there as well. It's, it's another of their passions. So eventually we see, eventually once the people come along to those particular locations, we see the teams working in a very similar way at each location. Mm. Mary, you wanted to say? If we just have a mic. You guys don't need to have the mic now, so if we can... Dylan, it was just about that point about the teams. Yep. Um, just that um, something that we've spoken about and something that our spirit friends have spoken about in terms of teams. Teams and the, the are not. Yep. No. I, I meant to say to you in the break, I, I just wanted to, yeah. Teams are not locale specific. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, we're all members of God's way of love team for whatever it is. Yep. And uh, our spirit friends were just talking about a already a culture growing amongst teams that we belong to this piece of land and immediately we're out of harmony with God <laughs> in that moment mm. um, and God's attitude towards the land mm. and how he intends for us to interact with the land. Exactly. So I just didn't want you to let you finish without just yeah. mentioning that. Yeah, very important to remember that. Every time you want to take ownership of what you do in some way, so and this is the danger of the learning centres. The danger of the learning centres is we all get involved in a learning centre and then we start viewing it, this is my learning centre, this is my learning centre. And what happens if the owners decide tomorrow we don't want it to be a learning centre? Most of us we go, what? What? We've spent two years doing this and that and planted trees there. I've spent all, what a waste of time. <laughs> you know, and we get all of these other emotions come in. When, when if we just have this feeling inside of ourselves of we want to give a gift to the earth, a gift to humanity, if we have that focus, then it won't matter to us so much as to where that focus is put in terms of different locations. So we actually want the teams, the, the, the teams actually, we feel are God's way of love teams, the organisation's teams, to help us do specific things. And this for a brand new set of think markers isn't very good. Um, so we have God's way of love teams and it, they belong to the God's way of love organisation which is not location specific. In other words, we want to do things to the whole world, not just to one particular area of the world. Gary, just behind you. Yeah, with that, there's uh, some people from, uh, one from Sweden and some from um, Italy yep. have joined the construction team. That's great. And... Um, you know, so that's all over the world, really, yeah. and some from Melbourne as well. Yep. Yeah, and I was going to say uh, also, um, I was thinking before, what's the difference between uh, an area of land like down there that they're going to donate all that land to, um, make it a you know, wilderness, more or less? There is, a, there is a fair bit of difference between that and just any old uh, normal national park. Yes. You know, in one's like just growing wild, but there's there is a fair bit of difference between one where you replant it and yes, and because, put extra sort of effort into it. As yeah, well. there's very few actually pristine national parks in the world anymore. Mm. Most of them have had a history of clearing hundreds of years ago or so, and so the problem is that what we see as a national park today is very often still being modified by a human in some way. 
And in fact, you often see the results of that modification when you walk through the National Park. You, you know, you'll see a mine here or, a, you know, different things. There's obvious proof that men have been there and damaged the land. What we want to do with the land is quite different to that. What we want to do is we want to get it back to the pristine condition. So what we're doing a lot of lately is channeling spirits who have been around six, seven hundred years ago who were on that land. And what did they see on the land? And you'd be surprised what Australia looked like then, actually. Many of you would be very surprised how big the trees were, how much fruit uh, there was inside the forests. You'd be very surprised to learn about the amount of extinct animals and birds that have occurred, uh, even in our country, just in 300 years. Um, you'll also be very surprised about the different, uh, the different species of plants that have disappeared completely, and all we have now is hopefully some seeds sitting in the ground dormant, waiting to come up once we get into the right condition. Because uh, the reality is a lot of the plants that we used to have just don't exist anymore because of what we've done. And so what we want to do with a lot of the land is not bring it to a national park place. We want to take it further than that and bring it back to, right back to some, some of the original things that used to be here. And there's a lot of other plans we have about that that, that are going to be only able to be done once some of us become at one with God. So to, to actually go through this process of bringing back species that have gone or disappeared. So it should be interesting in the long run as well in those locations. Um, it's very, I feel, important to understand too that, that there are a lot of people around the world who want to do these things. Like As Gary mentioned, there are a lot of people from different countries now who are very interested in what's going on with the different teams. And what we want to do is document things better so that we can give them information and help them out. And that is also going to require some of us considering travelling, for example, to go to those particular locations and uh, check things out. At the moment, there's places, uh, there's, there's a few people in different places who want to set up learning centres in different places. And we're in communication with them at this point in time. Um, and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in terms of their desires and passions and the long term process once they engage their desires more fully but some of them are very passionate about it they're changing their whole lives to to make it happen so they're very passionate about about their choices to you know do a project that benefits the world mm. and there's a lot of things like that that we can speak about there there are some other projects already uh, people un who want to be involved in other projects here in Australia already so but but again i can't discuss them fully because those still in the inception stages and and when you discuss them then people start getting involved in the process when it just needs to be a, a sort of a natural process that the people involved exercise their own desires yeah yeah any other questions no that's good no questions is that good no questions that means you know everything already that's good. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully from today's discussion, you can see that um, what we're attempting to do is to get away, you know, a lot of the media has had this focus on, ah, oh, AJ and Mary just want to have this great big, I don't know, empire or whatever they want to call it. <laughs> Honestly, myself and Mary are even considering getting rid of our own property so that we can be like free <laughs> so um the only purpose for us purchasing the property we've purchased and this is going to be very triggering for some of you is that um is that it was a way for both myself and mary to have some privacy to work through stuff uh, that's our primary purpose we do not feel in the end that we will actually own a property um, what we feel we would like to be doing is traveling from learning center to learning center and there be a little place for us on the le each learning centre that we can stay in while we're there, and uh, and then we just when we when we've exhausted each person in the learning centre, we just move on <laughs> to the next one. <laughs> Daily trips, <are> you? <laughs> Daily trips, yeah. And 
like for us, that's sort of our ideal uh, lifestyle. We don't want to actually own anything. What we would like to do, though, is help everyone who wants to care take and, and do all these other things and be involved in the whole process of learning about love to be really involved in that process. So that, that's our underlying passionate desire. So um, this is why we really like the idea of not ever being an owner of something. Like of, when we say owner, not having to take ownership of these properties. Because uh, we also feel that it engages the true free will of the individual as to what they want to do. And we feel that it's a very, very positive thing to do. Yeah. So, so we're looking forward to uh, put, implementing the changes that we made. I've got to first write them up, of course. But um, once we put them down on paper so that you can see them, it'll become a part of the constitution, which will register with ASIC. And, um, and that's not happening yet because I haven't done them yet. But uh, as I said, the current constitution allows us to do these things anyway. So, so it should be good implementing a lot of these different things. And I feel many of you will feel quite enthusiastic about even turning your own properties into becoming more harmony in harmony with love. And we've even considered doing things like having like an owner's meeting where where anybody who owns or caretakes property, so that's pretty much anybody because you all rent something, I suppose, and can come along and we can discuss principles of love with regard to the property in terms of how to make the property more loving, you know, how to look, a bit, look after it more lovingly and so forth. So we're looking forward to that process. It's one of our very many passions, so don't expect that it's going to be something that happens every day. Um, but... Uh, we're just hoping that um, we can do that over the coming months in particular because we do feel that we would like to have some locations that are going to be like examples to the world. Do you know what I mean? To demonstrate and prove the effectiveness of God's truth on the planet. You see, there's been no real um, scientific evidence or proof about things to do with the soul. Because nobody's really understood on the earth. Nobody on earth understands the soul yet, really. And because nobody on earth understands the soul, there's been no scientific processes involved to discover the relationships of what happens with the soul with a specific emotion and what happens to the environment, what happens to the family relationship and so forth and what happens to the human body when the soul has that emotion. There's been no scientific process to see the correlations. And you know what we feel quite strongly is that we'd love to see this process of investigation of these scientific correlations between the soul itself and the effects that it produces based on the different emotions and different conditions that it has. And we feel that uh, the learning centres in particular uh, are going to be one way where there'll be a sort of a concentration of, of, of effort in that regard to actually demonstrate those particular truths. And we're looking forward to that as being a mechanism to, to actually give people who need evidence, evidence of God's existence and th that the human soul is a real thing. It's not some figment of AJ's imagination that he's come up with through some kind of discussion, but rather it's a part of you separate to your spirit and physical bodies. And I feel that that's going to be a very powerful thing to, to teach humanity, hey? Okay, so that's the uh, different things that we'd like to do with the God's Way of Love organisation and they are the changes that we'll be making to the Constitution. So basically what we'll be doing to the Constitution is defining two different types of projects. The project that is of benefit to the world and the project that is of benefit to a more limited scope. And those type of projects particularly the project that's of benefit to the world, will receive more of our concentrated effort as teams. So the team leaders, uh, when we have team leaders meetings and so forth, we'll be focusing the teams on what's of benefit to the world before we focus the team on what's benefit to specific individuals. But we want to give gifts to everyone possible, including the community in which we live at large. And uh, we feel that as we do that, people will... Stop believing the false reports of what they're taught and told by people in the media who have an agenda 
and then they'll, and they'll start actually seeing the truth of how we feel and how we act with others. And that would be wonderful, uh, a wonderful teaching aid too, I feel. Are there any questions about this subject at all? No, everyone's hit fire away. And if we just have the mic over there, there's one coming back. My name's Dick Har. How are you, Dick Har? Good, I'm visiting from the US. Yep. Um, I'm kind of wondering about balancing in harmony of love with human survival on your learning centers in regards <laughs> to foods and different things. Yep. Um, we, um, if I just take a couple of these, myself and Mary, and all, in fact all of the 14 who are linked with, with uh, the, the divine truth at this point in time, feel quite strongly that we're not focused on human survival. Human survival... ...has a assumption, which is a fear-based assumption... ...that when you die, things end. And that's not true. So the problem that human survival, the whole aspect of human survival has is there's this focus on preventing death. We're not going to be doing anything to prevent death. What we want to do is prevent suffering and pain. Now, there are many spirits in the spirit world who have passed, who have died, and they're in terrible amounts of suffering and pain. So, so death doesn't end suffering and pain, unfortunately. What ends suffering and pain is love. So, so we're not focused on the human survival. We're focused on this aspect of love and bringing love into everything. Now, when you bring love into everything, there is a higher potential of survival. That's automatic. So in other words, if I love my environment, my environment has a higher potential to create what I need to survive. If I hate my environment or resent my environment or I attack my environment or I use my environment, I'm degrading my environment, now the environment has a lower potential to support my survival. Right? So, so if we focus on the aspect of love, which has to come from the heart first, from our own heart first, um, and of course we're talking about two forms of love here. We're talking about love that comes from our heart which we're calling the natural love that's within all of us and then there's also love that comes from the heart of god which can enter us which we're calling the divine love so if we focus on those two forms of love then human survival becomes a complete non-issue and instead of us being fear driven about survival we are now love driven because we're just going to love no matter what we do and where we arrive and where we go and the irony of doing it that way is that we have a greater scope to survive. We are going to survive better if we, if we love. The issue I feel the earth faces is that on earth there is this temptation to see love and survival as two almost opposites. And in fact, to a degree, sometimes the Darwinistic theories of life have affected this kind of discussion in the sense that there is this idea of the survival of the fittest and that seems to be very very different to love now what I suggest to you is that the fittest is the most loving so therefore the person who has the best ability to survive will actually be the person who is in the best condition of love and that is a truth a basic truth of the universe actually that no matter what our condition of love, if we're in a good condition of love, no matter where we live, whether it be here on earth or our body has passed and we live in the spirit world, we are going to be not just surviving but enjoying our life and having a lot of joy and passion. When it gets to just surviving, we're often in a very poor condition of love because now what we're doing is we want the environment to support me in my survival which is a very selfish orientation, 
rather than me giving to my environment because I know that I'm in a good condition of love and will survive anything. So it's a different sort of focus, if you like. So my suggestion is many of you, I notice, are still driven by your fears in your decisions. Now, I put to somebody in the break, for example, I said to them, what if myself and Mary tomorrow put our house on the market and sold it, right? And we moved 500 kilometres away. Would you still be where you currently are? Now I put to you that if you wouldn't still be where you currently are, then you've got to question how much you really wanted to be there. Can you see that? Right? Now some of you have made a choice to come to this location because you feel that an... Uh, uh, a learning centre will be in this location. And I agree with you. I do feel a learning centre will be in this location. But if the learning centre wasn't in this location, would you still have chosen to be here? It's a good question, isn't it? Right? And, and this is why some of the media attack in the manner they do, because they can see that perhaps many of you wouldn't be here. <laughs> You'd be somewhere else. And, and my suggestion is to think about that because if you're really passionate about choosing a location, it won't be dependent on where anybody else is or lives or anything like that. It'll be where you want to be. And you'll have the freedom to move as well. So you know that I can visit anybody anywhere in the world. So why would I worry about where in the world they are compared to where in the world I am? I wouldn't, would I? It's only fear that drives a lot of those kind of decisions in the end. Now, some of you have moved because you have a passionate desire to share in the Learning Centre experience. And I think that's a more positive ex thing to do. Right? That certainly is a positive thing to do. And some of it might be temporary in the sense that some of you may find that you learn a heap of things and then you decide you want to go out and create it with a whole group of people who know nothing about divine truth at this point. So some of you may decide you're going to go to Africa. Some of you may decide you're going to go to Russia. Some of you may decide to go to Vietnam. Some of you may decide to go all over the world to create what's being created here in the same manner that's being created here from a position of love. And I think that'll be fantastic. And when we catch up with each other, which we're certain to do because of the law of attraction, um, you know, it'll be wonderful to catch up and tell the different stories of what happened in these different locations. Um, I feel we have a great opportunity over the coming months to learn a lot as individuals, but we also have a great opportunity to not become attached to where we are, but rather to feel ourselves as world citizens who can go forth into the world and display the light, which is the love that's within us, to any person, whether they attack us or not. Yeah? And that is the most wonderful thing I could think of accomplishing as a group. So if we can see what's going on here more as a temporary learning experience than a permanent situation, and if we can look at our fears that we have, particularly our survival fears, if we can look at those fears and go, yeah, these survival fears are really the opposite. They're based on death. They're based on our fear of death. And they're really the opposite to love. And if we can stop looking at survival and start looking at love and then start looking at desire and all those other things connected with love, all of us will not only survive, but we will flourish. We will we'll enjoy the process that we're going through. Some of you are not enjoying the process because you're making choices and decisions that you don't really want to do, that you don't really want to make. And I put to you, why are you doing such things? Like You're better off living for, for eight months on the coast and loving it than you are living for the next 25 years near here and hating the whole experience. Aren't you? Like... Isn't it better? You pass in the spirit world, totally happy. You think, yeah, I lived in this awesome place down there on the sunny coast. And, you know, sure, the earth changes came, but I knew they were coming. But I was pretty happy with living there. That's where I enjoyed my life. And you pass in the spirit world in a place of desire. 
you can live out here and actually be in a place of hating it the entire time, your soul condition going down as you get more and more fear and anger about where you're living, just because that bloody AJ said to me, you know, that everything would be safe and wasn't safe at all. Look, the water came anyway and washed my house away anyway and all my stuff, and it wasn't safe at all. And, and yeah, sure, AJ was fine, but I wasn't. You know, That's the whole point. And, and so... You know, then it goes through this whole process. We go through this whole process of going, nothing's like what I was told. <laughs> and then we start complaining. And all the while, our soul condition getting worse and worse and worse. And then we pass into the spirit world. You're not going to pass into a place of desire. You're going to just pass in a place of complaint, right? Anger, rage. Uh, do you think that's going to be very nice? Definitely not. And who's going to surround you? All the other people in the same place or with anger rage you know complaint yet you know quite often when we're complainer on earth it's pretty good because we can go up to a person who accepts complaint you know and we tell them all our complaints and they just go mm, 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 right and then we go away and we go oh that feels better i've got all those complaints off my chest well the problem is in the spirit world you know who's going to you're going to walk up to another complainer, another complainer. And they're not going to listen to your complaints and you're not going to listen to their complaints and none of you are going to get your emotions satisfied that way. And how's that going to feel? <laughs> not very good, right? And so, and so what we need to do is we need to learn to live, we need to learn to connect to our desires and passions and we need to learn to live in them now. Fearlessly living in our desires and passions now and allow those desires and passions to be refined by our law of attraction into love. That's what we need to do. Now, if we do that, we will learn a great deal in a very short amount of time and also have the ability to benefit the world. And by the world, I'm not talking just about the world. I'm talking about the world of mankind, which includes spirits. And to benefit humanity in a positive direction that's what we'll be able to do and i feel that that would be a wonderful outcome if you're only here because you came here because you're afraid of where you're currently living right, or were living then i suggest to you that that fear still resides within you and that fear god's law of attraction is very very clever you know <laughs> He doesn't, you don't get away with things with the law of attraction. You can't manipulate events in order to avoid situations. If the fear is within you, it will guaranteed create events to trigger its fear, the fear. And if you haven't dealt with the fear of survival, guess what's going to happen? You are going to be very challenged with survival until you deal with that fear whether you live in, the, in King Roy or on the sunny coast or in the middle of a fault line in the USA, you know, on the, on the west coast. And so my suggestion is to stop focusing on the human survival factor and focus on the love because it's the love that's missing. If you think about all the new age things and all the scientific things and all of the religious things and so forth, if you look at every walk of life, it's the love that's missing. And uh, when love is present, it's just so engaging. But when love's missing, uh, uh, you, you're now basically back into the survival mode. So if we no longer worry about our survival, because no matter what happens, we are all going to survive. Right? Whether your physical body survives or not, you are still going to survive. <laughs> and if we stop worrying about survival and we start focusing on the real issue, and the real issue is... Is my soul becoming more loving? That's the real issue. Compare yourself with a year ago. Have you become more loving? Have you become more passionate? Have you become more desirous? What's happened? Now, if, if it's gone down the negative way and you don't feel as much passion, you feel less desire and so forth, then something has to change because that's the issue. There's no point in doing something unless it's going to bring you further happiness. Now, temporary unhappiness is fine. I've got no problem with temporary unhappiness. <laughs> right? 
We all have, are going to have temporary unhappiness while we deal with our different emotions. Is that not true? However, unhappiness for one whole year, something's up. Or two years, or three years, or five years, something's up. We need to change something if it's doing that. And what I suggest we need to change is our focus off of survival and fear and into love and desire. And if you change your focus into love and desire and off of fear, you'll find all your fears get triggered and you'll release them and then you'll live in a place where you're far more loving and you'll compare yourself with a year ago and you go, wow, I have grown so much in this last year. I have changed so much in this last year and it's all good. Right? Yippee. <laughs> <laughs> Myself and Mary often feel about this you know, as this subject, it's just like, to, uh, to us, we feel that if you can focus on desire and love and always be open and humble to receiving the truth, you can live a passionate life that you enjoy right now the majority of the time. You will have tears to cry, yes. You will have shame to feel, yes. You will have fears to feel. Yes. However, they will not take over your entire life for long periods. If they've taken over your entire life for long periods, then I suggest to you that you are not on the divine love path. You are doing something else. That's how it is. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And that's, what, that's why we created God's Way of Love organization, because we wanted people to start having experiences rather than just talking about truth, to have experiences where they can say, wow, in that situation, oh, I was pretty unloving. And wow, in that situation, see, often we do this. That person was pretty unloving in that situation. <laughs> right? That's, we see that quite clearly, right? That person, Christiana, you were so unloving in that situation. And while at this moment I'm projecting rage at poor Christiana, so who's being unloving? I am. So, so we need to bring the focus back on ourselves and, and really focus on that place of humility and love for ourselves and others. And the opportunities we have in the God's Way of Love organisation are to do that in a practical way and allow ourselves to see things that we might not normally see. And that's the main reason why we wanted the organisation to exist in the first place. So we hope that uh, you'll enjoy the process of engaging in some of these changes. Some of you we know will probably want to be involved with your properties in terms of getting some advice and so forth in terms of how to bring it more lovingly, bring it into a place of more love. Some of you might consider even um, a learning centre type project. But bear in mind the differences between those two types of projects. The projects that benefit the world will have a far stronger focus from the God's Way of Love organisation perspective, will have a far stronger focus on maintaining love at all times on the project. Whereas when we engage with an owner or their business or with their property or whatever, and it's not a project that benefits the world, then we will have a far lower, if you like, lower um, requirement of the owner to follow advice and so forth. That's up to them whether they follow that advice or not. So that's the general outline of what I wanted to present today. So thanks for your time today. Um, can I tell you a bit about tomorrow? Yeah. If, for those of you who want to come. Um, tomorrow, Cornelius and Isabella will be giving a talk tomorrow. They don't know how long it's going to take because by the time they've finished discussing everything, it might be three weeks later. But, um, <laughs> but uh, they're going to start tomorrow at least. And uh, the subject of the talk is an overview of divine truth subject. And the subject of the talk is reasons for the 14 returning to earth. So we're going to, they're going to discuss that from their perspective. So that should be interesting. And uh, so you don't have to put up with my ugly mutt for another day tomorrow. You'll be able to put up with two other people's beautiful faces instead. And, uh, and that would be, uh, I feel that you will enjoy. And, and come along asking questions. Eh? Allow yourself to ask questions because there's a, a lot of questions that you still have about those kind of things. And, and if you let yourself ask some questions about it, um, you'll really enjoy the conversation tomorrow. Thank All right. You. Thanks for your time today, guys. Thank you. I would.
I would also like to thank those, uh, those people that are considering their properties as learning centres. I just feel that, as you can see from this discussion, the courage that they need to do so is quite high and their trust is also quite high. And I, I think we need to just honour the fact that they, there's people who are in the world who are willing to put their own resources on the line for such projects. And I just would like to honour those people who are considering <laughs> those things. One thing we haven't had the chance to do is to thank all of our team leaders and our secretaries for the work they are already doing. Um, I feel that it's all volunteer effort and many of them are totally engaged in their volunteer effort and it's just wonderful some of the things that are getting uh, that, that are happening now and we'd just like to thank all of those team leaders and I know some of the team leaders are a little frustrated at the moment about getting things happening and so forth. Just let it all happen and it will all come about. The key is to just let the process happen and not become too frustrated with any seeming lack of action. The key is the action within the hearts of people. So that's the first thing that changes and if that changes, everything changes after that. So, But I'd just like to thank all the team leaders and their secretaries for their assistance. Um, I would also like to uh, thank Ange and Rob particularly. Um, I know that they've had a bit of media attention and so forth. Sometimes they get a bit more media attention than myself or Mary do even. And, uh, and I'd just like to thank, thank them too for like, there's a lot of things they've put on the line. So, um, and, their, and their courage and the, and the desire you guys have as well that, that, uh, that I feel is quite evident in, in our dealings with each other. And we'd just like to, thank, myself and Mary, just really like to thank you for your desire to be involved in it at that level. Yeah, yep. thanks guys. <laughs> okay, um, so we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and enjoying your company. Thanks for your time today, guys, and, uh, and I hope you've enjoyed the session today. Yeah. yeah.